we're actually seeing a shift in cultural norms around sickness and work. Because before that was a really powerful narrative, soldier on. If I had a cough, you know, I would take in a handkerchief and cough behind it, um, but I'd still come to work and attend meetings and so on. And, and, you know, people might think, oh, that's a little gross, but also it might feel like, well, that's better than looking like a slacker and staying home, you know, where nowadays the idea of coming to work and coughing even behind a handkerchief, right? Like people look at that as just, you know, not just not normal, but a sign that you're not caring for others. Hello and welcome to another episode of Idioms of Normality brought to you by Traces, Dreams and Future Frame TV. I'm here today with Associate Professor Lisa Wynn from Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. Lisa, welcome. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for talking to me today. Before we jump in with the first question, tell me a little bit about your experiences and your expertise that you bring to the question, what is normal? Well, I'm a cultural anthropologist. I've worked a lot in Egypt and also in North America, and I look mainly at sexuality. So, you know, the question of what is normal and sexuality, those things go together like that. Okay, so I'm going to jump in then. What is normal? (laughs) Okay, so when it comes to sexuality, we have all these ideas about what is normal. And, you know, sexuality is a very moralized area of society. And, And so for people who live outside of the norm, they face a lot of stigma. We know it with the history of uh, homosexuality and the way we've treated homosexuals historically in Australia and elsewhere. For me, I'm doing a lot of my research looking at people who have premarital sex in Egypt and uh, the struggles that they face to to claim the identity of a respectable person in society when they're doing something that's outside of the norm. What is stigma in this context? What is being outside the norm? What are the consequences? What's it like? You know, we have all these stereotypes about the Middle East, about, you know, honor crimes and honor killings. You know, a woman has sex and her family finds out and kills her and her partner. In reality, that is really rare. Reality is more that people want to claim the identity of a respectable person. They want the respect of other people in society. This makes sense. We all do, right? But when they know that they're doing something that falls out of what society considers to be normal or ideal, and by the way, those are, uh, you know, interestingly in conflict a lot of the time, what's normal, what's ideal, but when they overlap, you know, where they do in, in Egypt, like when people move outside of the norm, they work really hard to hide that from people who they think would judge them. So what I look at more is, you know, how do they hide it? Or if people know about their sexuality and sexuality that's outside of the norm, how do they manage their appearance, their presentation of self in order to avoid stigma? The stigma, you know, can range from people gossiping about you to, you know, being arrested for having extramarital sex. It happens, right? But what's far more common is the gossip, and that's insidious, and it affects your ability to get a job, to get married. It affects your standing in the community, all of these little things. And that's why people are working so hard to present themselves as normal, respectable beings. Can a certain level of status in society protect you from the bad gossip? Definitely. So, I mean, what people can get away with depends so much on your social class, right? Um, Wealthy people can get away with doing so much more, but they're still scrutinized by their peers. It's just that they also have more recourse to international, transnational discourses about normality in a way that the lower classes don't speaking specifically about my research in Egypt. So my ears pricked up when you talked about the normality and ideals. Can you expand a little bit more on on the blurry distinction between normality and and what is ideal? Yeah. 
Well, I have a really good example that doesn't come from my research, but it comes from the research of one of my PhD, former PhD students, Lindy McDougall. And she's got a book coming out this month, I think. I believe it's called The Perfect Vagina. I'll have to check on that title. It's a great book. Anyway, so she's looking at female genital cosmetic surgery. And what she found is that people who seek to get, you know, surgery uh, on their vulva, they're doing it because they think that what they have is not normal. But the reality of vulvas is that there's everything out there. I mean, you know, I think one of the doctors she interviewed uh, uses the analogy of snowflakes, you know, no two are alike. What is normal is to have huge variety, but what people want is a particular ideal. And yet they conflate that ideal with what is normal, right? And, and the ideal is soon becoming what is normal because if you don't have this particular kind of, a vulva, you feel like you're not normal. That's really interesting. So what is normal is diversity and variety, but there's a certain ideal that becomes popularized. And in the process of people popularizing and also trying to obtain that popular image for themselves, they are in effect, in effect normalizing the ideal. That's right. And creating new norms. And, and you see those norms, those norms get perpetuated in interesting ways. You know, the cosmetic surgeons who she interviewed would say, oh, people are seeing so much porn and the porn is what's giving them ideas about what their genitals should look like. But what Lindy found when she interviewed people is that their ideas of what constituted normal genitals were being more shaped by cosmetic surgeons' websites and before and after pictures on their websites more than porn. Wow, that's super interesting. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting case study, isn't it? Because we consider practices that happen in hospitals under sanitary circumstances with all the modern technology as something hygienic. And yet we can also, when we view other societies and other cultures, we can have a very negative view of practices that are somewhat similar in terms of how they change the body, but not necessarily in the sanitary hospital spaces that we have. In. So how does normality change across contexts? What do you mean? What, how does what is considered normal in one context differ from what is normal in other contexts? Why do we consider this cosmetic surgery acceptable in, say, Australia, and not just accept acceptable, but seemingly desirable by the clientele, whereas we might view people in other societies with other forms of body marking as unacceptable. Yeah. I mean, it has a lot to do with what you were just talking about, the construction of normality through its medicalization. You know, we have these ideas that when something's medicalized, that that puts it outside of culture. And, and so therefore it is, um, you know, it's seen as something that is idealized in some ways. I mean, you know, the perfection that can be achieved through um, a surgical, pristine medical intervention. When something is medicalized, it gives the appearance of losing cultural value or culturalness, yeah. if that's a word. <laughs> because the word normal is so often used in a medical context, we seem to naturalize what we consider normal without realizing that that's actually a cultural value. So returning to the example, the popularization of a particular shape of vulva is naturalizing and normalizing, not just normalizing it within a culture, but also naturalizing that look and making it not appear to be a cultural look, but making people possibly are starting to believe that this is a natural look, that if I'm not looking like this, then I'm not looking natural. Right. And another way that it gets constructed is not through just aesthetics, but people will make claims about comfort. You know, if you have labia that hang low, people will say, oh, you know, that, that disadvantages a girl who wants to participate in sport, for example. 
well, I don't know. I mean, men participate in sport and they have genitals that hang low. So I don't think we can, you know, put it all down to uh, matters of comfort and, you know, a, athletics and activity and so on. Right. But but this language of, you know, freeing women uh, from the constraints of their weird bodies, you know, that is also very powerful in naturalizing ideas about, you know, surgical interventions into our body. Yeah. The more I think about normalizing the body, the more I, I think the process of normalizing the body is, is about conditioning and enculturing the body to embody certain values that yeah. are not necessarily natural biologically. Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about your uh, more recent research because you've uh, I mean, this, this massive disruption to normality that has occurred in our lives over the last year and a half, you've been looking into. Tell us a bit about it. Okay, yeah. So I'm doing this research on COVID and on the way we think about infectious disease. You know, I have to give a shout out to the Australian Research Council. They're funding this project and also the Social Science Research Council in New York City. They're both funding this research. And what we're doing is a massive survey in Australia and also Ireland and New Zealand. It's an interesting comparison because these are three, you know, Anglo island nations that have had incredibly different experiences of COVID. So for example, as of, I think about a week ago in New Zealand, there had been, you know, 2,500 COVID cases and 26 deaths. In Australia, there had been a little more than 29,000 COVID cases and a little more than 900 deaths. And then in Ireland, 238,000 cases. So basically what we're seeing is order of magnitude difference. You know, like Australia has almost 10 times the number of cases and deaths as New Zealand and Ireland then has 10 times the number of cases and deaths as Australia. So it's a really interesting comparison to see how these different countries have experienced COVID. And so what we thought we'd do is ask people questions about their experiences of COVID and lockdown and also enforcement of COVID rules. Uh, because one of the things we're seeing, of course, with COVID is the way everybody wants to be involved in following the rules and ensuring that other people follow the rules. So that's something we're really interested in is, you know, vigilantism, uh, people confronting other people for not wearing masks. You know, how often does this happen? Uh, when do you report your neighbors to the police? And when do you say it's not my business? Uh, so we're looking at that. And we're also looking at the way people understand infectious disease in general, you know, so there was this really interesting case kind of early on in the pandemic in Australia, in Melbourne specifically, where there was a doctor who had come back from a conference in the U.S. and he had some symptoms. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna describe them because the description of the symptoms came out to be like really important in this narrative. He had some symptoms; they were mild. And he went to work anyway and treated his patients, treated maybe 70 patients or something over five days. And then he tested positive for COVID. Now, I think he might have been, I don't know, the 12th or the 15th COVID case in, in Melbourne. And so they were really, uh, at that point, you know, it was pre-community transmission. And at that point, COVID was still something that was coming in from outside. And so there was intense media scrutiny over this event. And the then health minister went on the radio saying something like she was flabbergasted that somebody with flu-like symptoms would go to work, right? And the doctor was very quickly named, you know, violating all medical privacy rules. Now, he wasn't named by the government, but because there were, you know, they named the clinic and there were only four male doctors at the clinic and it was pretty easy to work out who had traveled to a conference internationally recently and so on. So the media quickly figured out who he was and there was so much scrutiny, you know. So the minister had said flu-like symptoms and he rebutted saying, 
look, I had a mild cold, you know, and what doctor doesn't still go to work with a mild cold? I mean, we, we all do that. And we have this obligation to, you know, if we, if we all stayed home, he didn't say this, but, but other commentators said, like, if every doctor who had a mild cold stayed home from work, you know, the health system would collapse. And so you see, like, there was this completely different language, you know, flu-like symptoms versus a mild cold. We have these languages for talking about symptoms, like folk symptomatology, we would call it, as anthropologists that describe the same things, but they mean different things to different people. And I don't even know what most people think constitutes a flu-like symptom. It's something I'm asking in this research, you know, asking people like, what are the symptoms of an infectious disease? And and once we know what are those symptoms, you know, their idea of the symptoms, what do you do when you have these symptoms? You know, at what point do you decide to call in sick versus go into work and tough it out? At what point do you keep your kids home? At what point do you, you know, wear a mask when you go outside if it's not mandated? So all of these are really interesting questions from an anthropological perspective, just in terms of how people order and understand the world, but also they have public health implications. It's interesting too, because a lot of the messaging for the drugs you should take when you when you have the flu or the co- or a cold, a lot of the messaging was soldier on. You know, take this tablet, soldier on. and So that it, you can soldier on, yeah. Yeah, it, it fit the model that what was normal was to be productive, to go to work. And Absolutely. I, I was speaking with a school teacher recently too who said, it is more calamitous for me to take a day off work and have to do all the running around to make sure that everything's in place for my students than it is for me just to go to work sick. That's right. And it's strange how we've created this, these, these systems where we compel people to push through despite the symptoms. You're also talking about the blurriness of these symptoms. Well, that's right. But what you're getting at, too, is also about cultural norms to get back to, you know, what is normal, right? We're actually seeing a shift in cultural norms around sickness and work. Because before that was a really powerful narrative, soldier on. If I had a cough, you know, I would, you know, take in a handkerchief and cough behind it, um, but I'd still come to work and attend meetings and so on. And, and you know, people might think, oh, that's a little gross, but also it, it might feel like, well, that's better than looking like a slacker and staying home, you know, where nowadays you know, the idea of coming to work and coughing even behind a handkerchief, right? Like people look at that as just, you know, not just not normal, but a sign that you're not caring for others, right? We have different ideas now, I guess, about how you show caring around sickness and and what are the expectations around work productivity. And also a new norm is working from home. You know, there, there was a lot of resistance you know, pre-pandemic to the idea of people working at home, the idea that if you're at home, that's not a place where you're productive and that people wouldn't really be working. They'd be, you know, taking, playing with their kids or whatever. Now, you know, during the pandemic, during lockdown, I remember all these meetings when the associate dean of something or other would be leading a meeting and he'd have to excuse himself and go talk to his daughter, uh, a toddler, you know, and, and we could hear it all in the background. Before COVID, that would have been like an appalling lack of professionalism. You know, during COVID, during lockdown, it was what we were all doing. And now post lockdown, I think there's a lot more acceptance of the idea of working at home. So we're seeing a major cultural shift of norms around work and ideas about contagion. It's just very interesting, isn't it, that, that BBC reporter who was doing some Zoom, this is going pre-COVID, um, had his child and wife walk into the back of a, a TV interview, whereas since COVID has started, that has now become quite acceptable. And I, I feel like that's a very emblematic example of yeah. how, how attacked he was for, and all these assumptions people made about him as well in that moment. Whereas now we're, it's exposing the, all the things that we're juggling in our lives in, in a way that makes us a bit more accepting about 
the inter interruptions from other people's lives, including our own. Yeah, and that can be beneficial in terms of accepting that people have lives outside work that impinge on their work. But it's also affecting us in negative ways in the sense that there's more and more blurring between, you know, home life and work life and more of a sense that you can work at home and you can work weekends and and you're going to be working, you know, while your kids are asking for your attention too. There's a a lot of hype, particularly particularly in the media, about a return to normal, going back to normal. Are any of these discussions with your participants talking about their desires about adjusting to a new normal or returning to an old normal or establishing some sense of normality? Yeah, there's a lot of, you know, in the interviews I'm doing, we ask people questions about, you know, what would they do with particular symptoms and what has changed. And there's definitely a new norm that people in many ways are embracing this idea that it's okay to stay home and also to wear masks. You know, one of the things we ask people is, you know, with what symptoms would you decide to wear a mask when you go out of the house? And people will list, you know, a wide array of mostly respiratory symptoms, coughing, sore throat, runny nose, and so on. And then we ask them after that, we ask them, did you ever ever wear a mask before this pandemic? And almost everybody says no, you know, there's a new norm. The idea that you wear a mask and that's a way of showing caring. You know, people say, oh, back before the pandemic, the only people who you'd see wearing masks were Asians, right? And you'd, you'd look at them and you'd wonder why, why are you wearing a mask, right? And now everybody understands why. And for the Asian Australians that, that they were, that the Anglos were looking at and wondering, why are you wearing a mask? Well, it's because they had lived through a pandemic before too. And so masks had become the norm. And now, so we're seeing a, another interesting cultural shift there. I remember being on a, on a flight after the Zika outbreak in Brazil. And uh, I was one of only two people on a plane wearing a mask. And the flight, I, I'd made everyone around me super nervous because I was wearing a mask. Yeah. And it was only because I wanted to see my newborn niece that I was wearing this mask to ensure that I could reduce any, any risk so that I would be able to see my newborn niece as soon as possible. Um, but tension in the room went up, whereas now you wear a mask, tension in the room goes down. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Somebody I'm working with, he used to work in a pharmacy. Um, someone, my research assistant on this project, he used to work in a pharmacy and when he wore a mask at work, he said people would avoid him like crazy. They wouldn't ask him questions. They'd ask anybody else in the pharmacy a question and not, not go up to him. But he wore a lot then. <laughs> yeah. So the idea, yeah, that, that, you know, wearing a mask was a symbol of your own, you know, contagiousness or, or something. Whereas nowadays, uh, people are interpreting it differently as a symbol of um, your care and respect for others, you know. It's it's so interesting, particularly in countries like France where wearing the burqa is such a big debate, you know, a big hot topic. And here we are, because it's medical, you know, it loses the cultural connotations about it, even though it's entirely cultural. Yeah. And we put the mask on because it's, it's a symbol in many ways. You know, an N95 mask is only 95% effective. And so it's, it has symbolic value. It, it lowers the tension between strangers who feel, ah, oh, yes, we can be in the same room and interact and feel a little bit safer to be in each other's company, even though I don't know where you've been. I don't know where. One thing I found interesting is, in my experience, this is, I, I, I'm speaking maybe as a participant, <laughs> not as an authority, but in my experience, when you know someone, people feel less inclined to wear the mask. But if you don't know them, they're more inclined to wear the mask. And in a medical sense, it shouldn't matter whether you know them or not. Yeah. <laughs> you should be wearing the mask all the time. Yeah. And so it's funny how it's almost, is it Marshall Salins? Is, uh, you know, spheres of reciprocity. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> but, right. Like, COVID or, or any infectious disease doesn't respect that. In fact, it's more likely to circulate amongst your close spheres of reciprocity. <laughs> yeah. Now, here's another way that, you know, family and friends are coming up in the interviews we're doing in the survey, the online survey we're doing is, um, you know, one of the things we ask people is if you saw somebody not following the rules, you know, if there's rules around mask wearing or whatever, you know, what would you do? This is really interesting because it gets at our ideas about, 
norms of confrontation, you know, in society. And what we're finding is that people consistently are saying, well, the majority are saying, I wouldn't say something to a stranger because I, I don't like confrontation or I'd be afraid that they would shout at me or whatever. But I would say something to family and friends, you know. And to me, that's, that's really interesting because maybe it's because that's not what I would think of as normal. Like, I, I think I'd have a harder time, you know, telling my siblings, like, you should wear a mask, you know, than, than to tell a stranger. Because after I tell a stranger, then I could, I could disengage, you know, and not have to deal with the fallout of, of sounding like a know-it-all or something, you know. I don't know but, but there's a really strong sense about it not being normal to confront people. That said, there is still a, a minority of our respondents who are saying, yes, absolutely. I would talk to somebody and say, hey, you should be wearing a mask or, hey, you can't get on this elevator because there's already three people on it or, or whatever, you know. And, and so then I asked them, well, ha have you ever done that? And what's, you know, what was your experience? And actually, they're saying that they have done it and they had good experiences of it. They weren't shouted at. They would say, oh, do you mind stepping back? You're standing a little too close in line. Or do you mind, sorry, this elevator can't take more people on? Or, or do you mind pulling up that mask? And consistently, they're saying that people responded positively, that people were like, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. I didn't realize. I didn't notice I was standing so close or whatever, you know. And I think what that comes down to is there's this strong sense that the way you show that you're a good person and interested in the what's good for society, what's good for your country, you know, is in following these these rules. It's interesting how cultural values can be in conflict. There's, then there's this other cultural value that I feel living in Australia, which is to be chill, to, to not say anything, to, to put up, <laughs> to go, oh, I'm totally chill with it. Do you, do, you want to wear, do you want me to wear a mask? Oh, no, it's totally fine. When secretly I'm like, no, wear the mask, <laughs> please. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's a good and then there's all these people who talk. This is really interesting. People who say, well, I wouldn't confront somebody, but I'd give them the death glare. You know? <laughs> or, um, you know, like finding more subtle ways of communicating your dissatisfaction with somebody's decisions. And I think that reflects a general cultural sense that we have that, that nonverbal ways of showing disapproval are very effective at controlling our behavior. And then there are people who just, um, well, so for example, I was talking to one doctor who described how, you know, in, in his practice, they all have these rules about, you know, every patient who comes in has to wear a mask. And he had a patient who had been wearing a mask out in the waiting room and then came into the, into the consultation room with him and pulled the mask down under her chin. And he was just like, oh. you know, he was like so frustrated, but at the same time, he didn't want to say anything, right? Because he knows that like patients are rating doctors all the time, you know, and it affects your practice, it affects your business model. So <laughs> he didn't say anything, but he said he had to fart that day and instead of holding it in he just let it go <laughs> and he felt like that was his little petty revenge against somebody who wouldn't wear a mask you know um so it's really interesting thinking about these ways that we understand how to correct somebody who is violating a social norm when i'm listening to this I, i'm hearing a subtext of who are the purveyors of normality? And mm. it seems that we're surveilling each other about these new norms and we're establishing them amongst ourselves and that we're complicit in the process of establishing them. And there's, there's no single authority, there's no single person saying this is what it is. It's actually multiple bodies and it feels, it doesn't feel like it's, it's this top down directive, it actually feels like it's a lateral spreading. Is that the sense? That's, that's definitely true there. But we are all taking cues from the government, which is articulating ideas, at least in Australia, about what public health experts, public health experts, right? We hear that said all the time. In my interviews, people keep saying what public health experts say. And it's very convincing to people when the government said this is going to be the rule 
because public health experts say this is what we need to do, then people are really convinced. So it gets back to this medicalization idea, right? That whatever a medical authority says, like, has the ring of truth, and it's not authoritarian, it's not coercive, you know, even though these are becoming laws, right? Like, you know, when they tell people they have to wear masks on public transport and you can get fined if you don't, but it doesn't feel that way because there's this appeal to, you know, experts. However, there have definitely been cases during the pandemic where uh, they brought in laws that, uh, especially early in the pandemic, that people just didn't see the logic to them. They seemed irrational and they, therefore they seemed authoritarian. So for example, when people were allowed to, okay, during lockdown in Sydney, people were allowed to go out to exercise. So you could jog through a park, but what you couldn't do was sit on a park bench to rest and have a drink, or you could go to the beach and surf or swim to get your exercise because of this idea that exercise was, wasn't essential, but you couldn't go to the beach to just and lie in the sand and relax and take in the sounds of nature, you know, and people that, that led to a lot of conflict, right? Because that didn't look like it was evidence-based, you know, people were making comments about, you know, in the survey and also in social media at the time, like, how am I going to make somebody sick if I sit by myself on a park bench and nobody else is around me? You know where the risk comes in? The risk comes in when those police approach me to give me a fine. That's the only way we're going to transmit anything here is by the police fining me for this, you know? So what we've seen progressively through the pandemic, at least in Australia, is more of an appeal to public health authorities when articulating rules and laws around what you can and can't do. What I hear there as well is there's an, there's an appeal to an external logic. There's an appeal to something objective of this has to become established as a norm because of an external objective fact. That's right. It's, you know, it's the politician saying, hey, it's not me. That's what the chief medical officer said we have to do, right? Yeah, interesting. And so, he is in turn backed up by science, right? This love for science. Of course, now we're talking about Australia. You know, the, these all resonate for us. Like, you know, the majority of the people who I'm talking to are like, yeah, we want to do what the public health experts say we should do. Totally different, of course, in the United States, where there is this complete disconnect between, you know, public health messaging and what politicians were saying. And, and so there you see like this complete bizarre mishmash of ideas and no consistent, you know, acceptance of authority when it comes to public health measures around the, around, you know, how to protect people. What questions should we ask about the new norms that will be established through this process of fact creating and norm creating? You know, the thing that I'm really wondering about is after the pandemic, after, you know, enough people are vaccinated that we have herd immunity and people are traveling again internationally, you know, what is going to be the new norm with regards to work and mask wearing? And, you know, will we still feel like you should soldier on and go to work with a cough and a sniffle and a runny nose? Or are we going to see, you know, long lasting impacts on our cultural norms around work, working from home, you know, inviting our families into our workspaces and our Zoom calls and so on? You know, this is, this is still an open question. I'm really curious to know how it's going to play out. How long will the COVID related norms live on? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I share that. I share that interest. Associate Professor Lisa Wynn, thank you so much for joining us on Idioms of Normality, uh, hosted Dr. by Paul Mason. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I always forget to say my say my name too. People are like, you have to say your name, Paul. <laughs> this is Idioms of Normality, brought to you by Dr. Paul Mason, hosted by Traces Dreams and Future Frame TV. Don't forget to like share and subscribe. I always forget to say that too, because it does help us establish a really great platform for sharing discussions like this one, which I've 
thoroughly enjoyed. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul.